Tonight we are talking about contraception, which I think is unarguably a pretty important topic in general practice and certainly for GP training. And um, I have great pleasure in introducing our speaker tonight, Sally Sweeney. Sally is a GP uh, with expertise in sexual and reproductive medicine and over 16 years of clinical experience. And she works at our practice here in Newcastle for Family Planning New South Wales as a clinician and as a research doctor with the newly minted Family Planning New South Wales Research Centre. She is a clinical instructor with them and an extended skills placement supervisor with GP Synergy, the regional training organisation here in New South Wales and the ACT. She's a conjoint senior lecturer with the School of Medicine and Public Health at the University of Newcastle. And she's been a clinical examiner with the RACGP. And very important, I think, authored peer-reviewed papers in this field. Uh, so you'll be hearing from that kind of research academic element with some very practical clinical, clinical advice. Um, and this is our acknowledgement. Uh, as we always like to do, very sincerely acknowledge that the, uh, the tra traditional owners of the many lands on which um, we're meeting tonight and pay respects to elders past, present and their families. And I am joining you tonight. We are joining you tonight, in fact, from the Wobbacal lands here in the Hunter um, Valley of uh, New South Wales. Okay, thank you for that introduction, Simon. Um, so I'm just going to start off with um, what we'll cover tonight. So uh, firstly, we'll just have a bit of revision of the the best, best practice uh, contraceptive consultation, um, sort of a bit of revision of, of what, what ideally should be covered in that. Um, and then we'll go through and review the UK medical eligibility criteria guidelines and just um, uh, introduce you all to uh, some, some new and most up-to-date local resources. Um, there's some exciting updates on some recently released and um, new new options coming to the market soon. Uh, we'll spend a bit of time talking about LARC or long-acting uh, reversible contraception because um, that's, you know, obviously a, a, a emerging focus of, of our contraception work. Um, and then we'll finish off with a case study and some questions and answers. So we'll start off with reviewing uh, the contraception consultation because that's, you know, obviously really important that, that registrars have a really uh, solid approach to the contraceptive consultation and, and that sort of best practice um, approach of, of things ideally that we, we should be covering. So to start off with, you know, a contraceptive consultation really does involve a focused medical family and sexual history. Um, with the, the medication history, we're looking for things like, are they on any enzyme inducers? Is there any teratogenic medication in the mix that will make us obviously want to ensure that there is the most reliable available contraception on board? Um, significant medical history, uh, really focused on identifying any of those UK medical eligibility criteria contraindications, for example, migraine with aura or a VTE in a first degree relative under age 45. Um, uh, thromboembolic risk factors, um, any current symptoms, which is really important. So um, anything that might sort of signal whether there's investigations needed. Um, so especially if we're considering um, a LARC or an IUD, we want to know if there's any abnormal bleeding present that needs to be investigated. We want to know if there's anything that might um, symbol show that there's a indicate there's a uh, STI present, it's a new pelvic pain, dyspareunia. So we really want to explore if there are any current sex, uh, current symptoms present. Um, we want to take a good menstrual history, um, again, to just, you know, tease out whether there's any underlying investigations that need doing. Sexual history, um, a, a reproductive and pregnancy history. Um, and particularly um, identifying if there's been any contraceptive failures. So if there's been unintended pregnancy on, on a pill, for example, we might be thinking about um, exploring options of LARC in, in these women. Um, assess compliance in women who are already using a non-LARC method. Um, that's important. We know that 30% of unintended pregnancies in Australia are in pill takers. So it's great if they're on the pill, but they've got to take it. So it's really important to assess that compliance. Um, it's important, I think, to mention as well that since the renewal of the cervical screening program in December 2017, we've really moved away from what was historically, I remember 
as a registrar being taught about the, the two yearly well women's check where, you know, women would be recalled in for their pap smear and their breast check. And that really is a thing of the past. And, and we're really moving away from that two yearly opportunity for that, that well women's checkup. Um, and increasing use of LARC and a move to five yearly cervical screening means that there are less frequent visits for women. So it's really important that the contraceptive consultation has a, a real focus on those opportunistic activities um, that we should be doing and, and thinking about and an opportunity to, to be giving out some, some reproductive health advice. Um, in terms of those opportunistic screening, um, obviously a imp really important thing to cover off in, in the contraceptive consultation, particularly women under 30 where the incidence of STIs are higher, but also not forgetting that, that um, you know, women, older women who may be separated, divorced, moving on to new relationships as well. There, there are high incidences of STIs among those women as well. STI screening, really, really important. Um, and for anyone who's not aware, you can see that um, the, the STI guidelines, uh, they became available and were released around 2018. And they're put together by the um, ASHA, uh, Australasian Sexual Health Alliance, um, and they're, they were really designed for primary care use and they're, they're probably the best online guideline I've ever seen in that they're really user-friendly. You click up the top and you can choose from a syndrome or a symptom or an infection um, and they're really very helpful. And the beauty of those guidelines is that they are reviewed every 12 months. So you can be assured that you are accessing the latest information there. Um, so the, those Australian STI guidelines are, are really important that you, you make your registrars aware of those. I probably use those myself most days. Um, probably the next important thing after STI screening is, is cervical screening. Um, and just to plug there, that um, I think as we all, all are very aware now since the renewal at the end of 2017, there are a very comprehensive set of online guidelines there and that's where you will find the cervical cancer screening guidelines. It's a bit of a clunky website to remember. I always just find myself, if you haven't saved it into favourites, if you're working on different workstations, I just uh, Google wiki cervical screening and it, it will bring it up. Um, they can be a bit clunky to use and it, it's important to recognise that um, they are designed to target different populations of women. So post hysterectomy, investigation of symptomatic women, women following up previous abnormalities. So it's really important that, that registrars are familiar with um, how to use them, how to access them. And again, they are updated routinely from time to time. So as recent as February this year, there was a change to the management of the intermediate uh, cervical screening result pathway. So it is important to be frequently checking in with those and making sure that, that we're familiar with them. Um, I guess as a side note there, um, a paper that I published with our team at Family Planning last year found that um, around 37% of, of clinicians offering cervical screening in New South Wales um, had access to them never or rarely and 13% and didn't know where to find them. So really important that, that your registrars know, know where to access those. Keeping in mind that um, uh, particularly for, for our women over 40, um, to be thinking about other screening things opportunistically in that contraceptive consultation. So breast, bowels, cardiovascular risk, fracture risk are all also really important to be assessing, uh, keeping in mind that cardiovascular disease is still the biggest killer of women. So it's a good opportunity to make sure that we're across those cardiovascular risk factors as well. A bit of a new one, uh, some, some people might not be familiar with this one, is, is the concept of reproductive screening. Uh, there's this concept called One Key Question. Um, basically, it's an initiative of the Oregon Foundation for Reproductive Health in the US. And it's this concept that once a year, we are asking all women of reproductive age whether they'd like to become pregnant in the next 12 months. If the answer is no, then obviously we're ensuring really effective contraception is on board. Um, but if the answer is yes, then it, it's, it's an opportunity for us to sort of delve into um, bringing them back in um, for formal preconception care um, or maybe tailoring their contraceptive choice um, based on their timing of pregnancy planning. So, for example, if somebody is using Depo-Provera injection, we do know that sometimes it can take up to a year or 18 months for fertility to return after that. So, if you've got someone on Depo and they're saying, oh, look, I might want a pregnancy in 12 months, we might just think about 
tailoring the contraception. So that's that's um, sort of a, a new concept to be be thinking about. Um, and then um, also to considering uh, domestic violence and reproductive coercion screening. That's a bit of a new one and it's not really a guideline-based recommendation, but it is a bit of an, an emerging uh, concept. Um, finally, in terms of a um, most important, well, very important aspect for our, our contraceptive consultation is a, a focused examination. So certainly blood pressure and BMI are really important in informing if there's any contraindications. So hypertension, um, depending on the degree of hypertension, can be um, a, a contraindication for use of oestrogen. Um, BMI over 35 is a, um, a contraindication for, for combined oral contraception. Um, examination um, could be focused here. So if someone's planning an IUD or considering an IUD um, and they've never had a speculum, this is a, a common occurrence now, particularly given that we're not starting routine cervical screening till 25 and we're seeing younger and younger women presenting for IUDs. Often they've never had a speculum examination. So before we even think about offering them an IUD insertion in rooms, we want to see how they how they tolerate a speculum because you know that if, if a young woman's not tolerating a speculum well, she's really not going to tolerate a, a IUD insertion in the room. So you can you can make an easy decision then to refer her on for insertion with some sedation. Probably a point that we're all well and truly aware of by now is that this, this idea of routine breast and pelvic exams on asymptomatic women really is no longer indicated. The sensitivity of a breast examination on an asymptomatic woman is, is very, very poor, and a pelvic examination on an asymptomatic woman doesn't change our management. Um, but just to say that we must always examine asymptomatic patients. So if a woman's presenting with a new breast lump, then absolutely we're going to examine that or if there's you know a, a new gynecological symptom particularly abnormal bleeding pelvic pain pain with sex we really need to be examining um you know there's so many stories that, that come through where you know a woman's been self-treating for thrush or you know a clinician's advised her it's thrush and no one's ever had a look and you know there, there ends up being a, a terrible malignancy of the vulva that no one's ever looked at or certainly if there's abnormal bleeding we need to be um, examining and um, doing co-testing as indicated and making sure there's not a structural lesion and you know, re really making sure that we're examining our, our symptomatic patients that's very important. Um, moving on, just to really revise um, the, the UK medical eligibility criteria, nothing's really changed. These are still our gold standards of, of what we rely upon in terms of contraceptive safety. So um, I won't spend too, too long on this slide because I think we're, we're all very familiar with this. So a, a MEC1 condition is really something where there's no restriction to using that method of contraception right through to a MEC4 contraindication where it is an absolute contraindication. MEC3, you'd really be thinking about using other options and, and only using it as a last resort or if nothing else had been tolerated. Now, just to say that these guidelines were updated in 2016 um, and that you can find them very easily um, at, at that website. If you can't remember the website, I find myself just Googling UK MEC FSRH and, and it will bring you to, to those, those charts. There's some really nice summary charts. They're freely available online. Um, so I'd really, you know, make sure that your registrars know where to access them, how to access them, and they really do form an integral part of your contraceptive consultation. Um, so, Moving along to, to what are our important current resources. So really those, those FSRH, the UK Faculty of Sexual Reproduction and Health, um, they really are the cornerstone of, of what we use. And in Australia, our guidelines are very much informed by um, what the FSRH are, are saying in the UK. So those guidelines, um, like I said, they can be freely accessed um, and they've got lots of uh, little sort of sub guidelines there. Um, there are some very useful specific guidelines that, you know, I use weekly in my practice. Um, there's a specific guideline that looks at uh, contraception in women over 40, which is really useful because it 
gives you really clear advice on, you know, when you can cease contraception, contraception in, in menopause transition. So the specific guideline and contraception in women over 40 is really useful. There's also a separate uh, guideline that they've put out um, that looks at uh, drug interactions and enzyme inducers. And, and it's a really nice little PDF that sort of looks at what's safe, what's not safe, depending on the drug. Um, and all of those can be downloaded as a PDF or accessed online. Um, important note that, you know, a lot of the, the Family Planning Contraception Australian Clinical Practice Handbook, I think, is in most rooms of practices where I work. It's the, the red contraception book. Um, that has uh, this year been superseded by the new released, newly released Therapeutic Guidelines Sexual and Reproductive Health. So um, the, the contraception handbook is no longer in production and you can no longer get it. So if your registrars are looking for the most up-to-date guideline, um, you should be directing them to the Therapeutic Guidelines chapter on sexual and reproductive health. It's an excellent resource. It's, it's very comprehensive. It covers all methods of contraception. Um, there's other chapters, information there on things like medical termination of pregnancy. So it's a really useful guideline that, that your registrars um, should be familiar with. Um, and ideally, you know, making sure you, your registrars have got access to those through your practice. That's important. Um, just a, a few other things there that the websites there um, that I was talking about with the women aged over 40 and drug interactions, both of those were updated in 2019. So they're very current, excellent resources. I'm going to say, Sally, an, another one that I've found very useful has been the one on um, women who are uh, overweight or obese and specific uh, recommendations around contraception for them. Yeah, yeah, that's it's always a, uh, it's becoming an increasingly um, issue, issue in it. You know, B, if you think BMI over 35 is a, a contraindication for, for combined oral contraception, it's a lot of women that, that we're having to shift onto something else. Um, there is a new product coming to the market that I'll talk about later that may um, give us some more options in that space. So um, I will come to that. So moving along to combined oral contraception. So this is a slide that I put together a few years ago that all of our registrars that come through family planning, you know, that they, they've got their books out and tend to write down. It's, it's, it's just to kind of demystify the contraceptive pills on the Australian market because it's one of the things that registrars, particularly if they've not done a lot of women's health or, you know, they've done a lot of medical terms in hospital and they're very new to contraceptive prescribing, it's really about getting your head around which pills are which and what pill contains what. And, you know, I always encourage registrars to be really familiar with a couple of pill formulations that you'll start most patients off with and then having an idea of, of which pills can then be your backup pills if you run into problems with those ones to sort of tailor your pill prescribing. But um, often, I often spend one or two learning sessions just on tailoring combined oral contraception prescribing um, for registrars because it, it can be a little bit of a challenge. On this slide, you'll also see a link down the bottom to a really good article that was written a few years ago by some of my colleagues at Family Planning about um, choosing a combined pill based on if there are certain side effects. Um, and there was a question that came through in the pre-webinar uh, questions about which pills and how to switch if there's side effects. And that, that article there really, really covers it nicely. Um, but basically this slide, we'll see that most pills on the Australian market contain the same estrogen. So you'll see over on the left, there's a box there that says ethanol estradiol. That is the synthetic estrogen that is contained in most pills on the Australian Australian market. And what differentiates combined pills is the type of progesterone that they contain. So up the top, we've got our most basic pills, the good old levonorgestrel containing pills, which is levelin, microgynin, and we've got our norothyst norothysterone containing pills, which are brevinor and norimin. They are our PBS listed pills in Australia, and they're our most common first line prescribed pills. Most women will do fine and tolerate levelin, or Brevenor or Norman, or, you know, most women will tolerate a levonorgestrel or a norethysterone-based pill. They're cheap, they do the job, they're very good. They've got good safety profiles. But for some women who don't tolerate those pills and run in side effects or who have some specific needs, then we may need to look at tailoring the progesterone. So we get into things like, um, you know, our, our um, desogestrel-based pills or Marvalon. So back in the, the 90s, before we had our cyproterone-based pills, we used to use the, the Marvalon for a lot for, for acne. 
And then we've got our newer progesterones that have come out in the last 20 years or so. So we've got our cyproterone-based pills, which are more, more targeted for acne. So they're our Dianes and our Estelles. We've got our drosperinone-based pill, which is Yasmin and Yaz. Remember when it first came to the market, the drug company was really trying to sell it as the weight loss pill. Um, but really all it was that, you know, the drosperinone has a slight diuretic activity, so you're less likely to get bloating. Um, and then in around 2012, some new um, sort of what we call bioidentical estrogens came to the market. So two new pills came to the market that contain a, a different type of estrogen. Uh, there's one called Clara that contained estradiol valerate and one called Zoli, which contains estradiol. Clara didn't really take off because it's got this really confusing quadrophagic, quadrophagic regimen where you've got four different doses and, you know, trying to understand a missed pill regimen in that pack, I think you need a PhD. But Zoli is, is a really nice pill because it contains a progesterone called nomogestral acetate, which has a really high affinity um, for the endometrium. Um, so it's a really good pill for um, heavy bleeding, breakthrough bleeding on lots of other formulations, um, dysmenorrhea, um, and it's also a bit more mood neutral. So it's a good one to use for women who have maybe had some, some mood issues on, on other pills. Um, and that, that's also the case for, for your drosperinone-based pills. Um, so, you know, some examples of switching. So often a common one is women who become nauseated on, on the contraceptive pill. We can either reduce the estrogen there um, or then obviously looking at a LARC method. Um, if there's breakthrough bleeding occurring on a pill, um, you might want to try a more progestogenic pill. So a norethisterone with higher dose and moving them to something like Noramin 1 or again that, that Zoli, the uh, nomogestral acetate pill. Um, or if you've got issues with mood, so particularly women who might be having severe PMS or, or you know, more severe versions of that PMDD or premenstrual dysphoric disorder, um, or women who are, are very sensitive to exogenous hormone and have had mood change on other preparations, we might think about using a drosperinone or a, Zola, a drosperinone based pill or a Zoli. Um, there was some evidence out um, by John, John Eden wrote a really nice article about treatment of, of PMS and PMDD. And he sort of said that um, up to 70% of women with very severe PMS will improve with either a drosperinone or a, a normogestrel acetate pill. There's really, just to say, um, there's really not a lot of place for microgynin 50 anymore. It's a very high dose, 50 micrograms of estrogen pill with levin or gestrel. Um, a lot of the old gynecologists still love to prescribe it, so you will still see a bit of it out, but it, it does have a very high VTE risk because it does contain such a high dose of oral progesterone. So, you know, I, I never prescribe it um, and it really doesn't have much of a place. Um, but that's a really nice slide to have to sort of talk through with the registrars and sort of understanding where the different pills sit and, and what the differences are. Um, and if anyone wants these slides, I'm happy for you to email um, the organisers at the end and we can get them distributed. Um, just a little bit more about, um, I guess, some, some newer estrogens. So um, the newer formulations on the market. So as I said, until about 2011 or 2010, all combined contraceptive pills on the market contained ethanol estradiol in varying doses as their estrogen. Um, and then like I said we had this um, estradiol valerate, clara, clara pill, um, and then we've got Zoli. Um, and there's... The idea with the, um, these two pills, Clara and Zoli, was that theoretically by using this sort of um, uh, bioidentical, I mean, that's a terrible word, bio but the, the estrogen is more um, chemically like the natural estrogen produced in the body. So there was this sort of theory that it would have reduced effect on liver metabolism and clotting systems and a potential safety benefit in relation to VTE risk. So if you compare them head to head, the dose of estrogen in Zoli is the equivalent to about two micrograms of ethanol estradiol. So the theory is that you're actually getting less estrogen exposure and you'll have less VTE risk. But real life evidence for that is still pending. So we must still treat these pills with the same um, medical Ill eligibility criteria and contraindications um, because there, there's a very large uh, PRO-E2, it's a large scale multi-centre international study, um, but the data on that is still pending. It was comparing um, outcomes of Zoli with Levlin. Um, 
So just to say also that there will be a new product coming to the Australian market, I would think either the end of this year or next, next year. It is a new estrogen again, uh, something called estratol or E4. Um, and it's, it's something called a nest, which is a native estrogen with selective action in tissues. So E4 is the estrogen produced by our, our adipose tissue. Um, and the thinking is that it will have less activity on the breast um, and a lot of safety benefits. Um, and it's going to be released in combination with progesterone, which will be a new option again for a combined contraceptive. So that's just a, a bit of a, a watch this space for that one. Um, I do need to say a bit about cyproterone-based pills. Um, so, so your cyproterone-based pills are our pills that contain cyproterone acetate as their progesterone. So the trade names for those are things like Diane, Estelle. Um, they're really... Um, should be used only as described in the product information. So for severe androgenization, and there really needs to be regular reviews. So they are um, indicated for acne. And really, if, if the woman's been on it for a few years and her acne has settled, we really should consider switching her over um, because these pills do have a higher VTE risk compared to the non-cyproterone pills. Um, still, overall, the absolute risk is low, but the relative risk is, you know, between four and eight times higher risk of VTE with these pills compared to our, our non-cyproterone pills. And it's important that your registrars are all aware that cyproterone-based pills are not actually licensed as contraceptive. So to be prescribing them just as a contraceptive for women who don't have severe acne, that's actually, um, it's not the indicated, it's, it's off-label prescribing. Um, and in terms of evidence for some pills being better on acne than others, there's, there's not a lot of good evidence that that says some are some are better. So often, if the skin's nice and settled, it will remain settled if we switch to another pill because all of the pills will mop up androgens by the increase in sex hormone binding globulin that they induce. Um, so that's just an important uh, thing to keep in mind. Um, Interestingly on that, um, there was a 2019 paper published in the BMJ by a GP Synergy academic registrar, and it was focused on LARC, but one of the interesting sort of things that it used, it, it analysed recent data and found that between 2010 and 2017, cyproterone-based pills were actually the second most commonly prescribed pills by GP registrars. And when a, a pill prescription uh, was, was prescribed, uh, it was about 10% of, of, of pill prescriptions were for cyproterone-based pills. So it's really important to have that discussion with registrars that it, these pills really should just be reserved for women with, with quite nasty acne and thinking about once they've been on them for a few years and once the skin's settled, we can switch them to, to another pill. Um, and a bit more, I mean, this really came to the headlines in, in December 2017 when a, one of the federal MPs had a daughter uh, develop a, a VTE after she went on a long-haul flight. She'd been on Diane for three weeks and was subsequently found to be a Factor Five laden carrier. So then he tried to pass a bill that Diane be screened and then a whole lot came out about should we be doing thrombophilia screening on, on all women before we prescribe the pill? Um, the thing to remember is that a negative thrombophilia screen cannot exclude VTE risk because 50% of cases of VTE have no identified thrombophilia. Um, so there is no role for sort of routine blanket thrombophilia screening when we're prescribing pills. And we really still just need to stick by our risk assessment based on family history. So if there's been a first degree relative with a VTE uh, under age 45, um, it is a UK MEC3 contraindication. Um, so really just be following those MEC guidance uh, guidelines and don't prescribe any combined hormonal contraceptives for MEC4 or preferably also MEC3 conditions. Um, so just a little reminder slide, this one. Um, so past history or current VTE is MEC4 for combined uh, hormonal contraception, known thrombogenic mutations, that first degree relative under age 45. And that's something that a lot of people don't think to ask about. And I have picked up a few young young girls where mums had a, a you know DVT in her early forties, and, and you know automatically that that mean and if it was particularly if it was unprovoked, um, we need to be thinking about the risk for that young girl. Again, BMI over thirty five. Sadly, that's something that we are seeing increasingly. 
um, major surgery. A lot of the surgeons will write you letters saying that they've, they've taken your patient off their contraception six weeks prior to their surgery, which is great, but you know, we don't want them pregnant in the meantime. Um, and postpartum are uh, less than 21 days as well. All right, so just moving on a little bit, I did, uh, when Simon mentioned um, contraception prescribing, you know, obese women, um, we do have a new product that will be released in Australia to, the, to our market here. I think it's coming August slash September. So this is very exciting. This is a new progesterone-only oral option. So it's a drosperinone-based progesterone only pill it's going to have a cyclical regimen so there'll be 24 active tablets four placebo tablets the active tablets will contain four milligrams of drosperinone it will unlike other progesterone only pills on the market which don't actually stop ovulation they just work by um you know thickening that cervical mucus and thinning the endometrium this product will actually stop ovulation okay um so it's a bit of a game changer um because That'll mean that we'll have a 24-hour window to be late with this pill rather than the three-hour window, which is where we lose a lot of efficacy with our current progesterone-only oral options. Uh, phase three data um, has shown comparable efficacy to combined hormonal contraceptives and more importantly, more acceptable bleeding profiles than currently available POPs. So a big problem that leads to discontinuation of our currently available mini pills is that they get a lot of breakthrough bleeding. So um, the phase three data with this one did show um, pleasingly that there was increased amenorrhea and less unscheduled bleeding the longer a woman stayed on this pill. And most importantly, it is safe uh, to use in women with increased VTE risk. So particularly um, older age. So we get to women, you know, a woman at 50 who is wanting reliable oral contraception, we could easily switch her to this pill. Um, with those women with BMI over 35 who, who still want a reliable oral option, um, those women on um, contraceptive pills where you identify migraine with aura, who still want an oral option, this is a, a nice op option to be able to, to switch these women to. Um, so that, that's going to be coming to, to our market in the next few months. So that's an exciting development. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go through the currently available emergency contraceptive options. So on the left, we've got the copper IUD, which is the most effective emergency contraceptive on the Australian market. Um, but obviously, logistically can be tricky um, and is quite an invasive option for, for a woman, you know, who, who turns up wanting some, some emergency contraception who may not want an IUD. Um, L1 is that, that picture there in the middle. It, um, so L1 came to the Australian market um, in 2016 um, and it is an oral uh, emergency contraceptive option. And then on the right there, you'll see a picture of our existing uh, levonorgestrel um, emergency contraceptive option. To say, because um, L1 or ulipristal acetate, it's just a bit of a newer player. So again, it's something that some registrars might not be aware of. It is our most most effective available oral emergency contraceptive option. And unlike the levonorgestrel um, emergency contraceptive pill, which really only has up to 72 hours effect effectiveness, and it's more effective the earlier you take it, um, ulipristal acetate has linear efficacy for up to 120 hours, so five days after an episode of unprotected sex. Um, it prevents ovulation at a later stage than levonorgestrel. So even after the LH surge has occurred in the cycle, it can still prevent that egg being released. Um, slightly uh, higher efficacy for heavier women. So efficacy is reduced if BMI is over 30 compared to over 26 for levonorgestrel emergency contraception. The, the thing to be mindful of is that it, it's, it, it, it competes for uh, progesterone enzymes. So it um, will have reduced efficacy if there has been other hormonal contraception, so pills, depo, implanon, uh, seven days prior or five days after. So this is not one to use if a woman's had a few missed pills. Uh, this is one to use for a woman who's not currently on contraception. And then if you are going to, to start her on some contraception after taking this one, you do need to wait five days after taking it before we commence some oral, uh, some, some hormonal contraception. Otherwise, we run the risk of reducing the efficacy of, of the emergency contraceptive. 
Um, just to keep in mind, it is um, affected by enzyme inducers. It is more expensive. Um, it costs about $40 to $50 compared to the Levinor Gastro ECP, which is closer to $20. It does also compete with the steroid receptor. So we do just need to be care if, if there's a woman with a steroid dependent um, medical condition. So a woman on, on high dose steroids for, for asthma, for example. Um, initially, when this came to the market, the advice was that there was a contraindication with breastfeeding, but the most up-to-date therapeutic guidelines now advise that there is no need to interrupt breastfeeding with this one, which is good. So we move on now to LARC. So uh, long-acting uh, con long acting reversible contraception. So LARC is a very important option and we are moving more and more to LARC as first line uh, for women of all ages. Um, so this really uh, was brought out by the US Contraceptive Choice Project, which looked at nearly 10,000 women who were provided with free contraception if they were willing to start a new reversible method. Women aged 14 to 45, and it ran from 2007 to 2016. And overwhelmingly, what it found that 75% of women chose LARC. Women using LARC had higher rates of satisfaction but most importantly, women who used a non-LARC method were 20 times more likely to have an unintended pregnancy than those who used LARC. And continuation rates of LARC were greater than the pill and depo. There's a bit of controversy as to where depo sits. Some guidelines include depo in LARC because it is used less than monthly. Other guidelines don't include it in LARC. Um, so the Contraceptive Choice Project did not include depo in LARC. Now, very famous Australian research, Danielle Mazza, who's based down in Melbourne, um, attempted to, to replicate that US contraceptive choice study uh, here in Australia. And that was something called the, the ACCORD trial or the Australian Contraceptive Choice Project. And it really was the Australian version of the US Contraceptive Choice Project. Um, and the primary aim was to increase the uptake of LARC amongst Australian women. Um, it ran between April 16 and January 17 and included 57 general practices in Melbourne. Um, and it trialled an intervention where uh, GPs received training to provide a, a LARC first structured contraceptive counselling intervention and implementing rapid referral pathways to LARC insertion, so really optimising access for women to LARC. Um, and it was something called a clustered randomised control trial, trial where GPs were uh, randomised to either the intervention arm where they did a six-hour online training module in uh, structured contraceptive counselling focusing on LARC and were given rapid referral pathways for their women to access LARC. And the control arm was GPs who were providing usual contraceptive care. Um, and overwhelmingly, you know, th this involved um, 740 women and increased LARC uptake was, was noted in, in the intervention group. Um, so same sort of findings um, as what was found in, in the US study. Um, yeah, null, null parity is not a, contraindic a contraindication to IUD. So that's probably one of the biggest myths that, that we all need to be busting with our registrars. And that Family Planning Alliance Australia uh, resource, it's a really fantastic resource. And I, I you know, when, when designing a teaching session on LARC with your registrars, I'd really be looking at that, that website there because it's got lots and lots of, of resources there to support LARC education. The, there's a statement there from the, all of the family planning organisations in Australia of which Family Planning Alliance is the umbrella organisation. And the take-home message there is really that LARC is highly effective and safe for women across the reproductive lifespan, including younger women and those who have not had children. Um, the one thing to consider is that we might want to consider insertion under GA for adolescents, but it can IUDs can be inserted quite easily in rooms. I've, I've put IUDs into many 16-year-olds in my rooms with no problems. They lie there on their phone looking at Facebook. Some of them dial up Netflix and, you know, happy as Larry and they tolerate it really well. Um, no increased rates of PID with, with IUDs. Um, and really the only contraindications is that you can't insert an IUD if there is a current pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, and we really do need to be um, investigating any, any abnormal symptoms, any abnormal bleeding, STI screening prior to, to those IUD insertions. Um, this is just a really great little resource from the Family Planning Australia Alliance. 
you can use it in with your registrars and also we use it with women in contraception counselling there just about um, the different uh, effectiveness rates of, of the different options. Um, just to say another new product to the market, it's really exciting to talk about new products in contraception because they're not often available. So we probably all have heard of the Kylina. Um, so it really is the, the mini Mirena. So the Mirena contains 52 milligrams of levonorgestrel. The Kylina by comparison contains 19.5. So you're getting much less hormone exposure. It was PBS listed since March 2020. It's got smaller dimensions there. So, um, you know, the main advantage is that insertion is a lot easier, particularly for those, those nullips. Um, and, yeah, they, they go in. It's amazing how easy they go in. It's just such a little thin inserter. They just go, they go in so easily. Um, it does have slightly higher overall spotting days and less amenorrhea compared to the Marina device. Um, and just to note there, there is no off-license extended use. So with the Marina, in some situations, we can use them for seven years. Some situations, if we put them in over age 46, we can use them for up to age 55. There is no extended use for Kylina. So it, it's five years for everyone. Um, there is less benign functional ovarian cysts compared to the Marina. And it's not indicated as the progesterone component of menopause hormone therapy, and it's not indicated for heavy menstrual bleeding. And just some um, images there of all of the IUDs available in Australia. So we've got the Marina and the Kylina there on the left. We've got the Copper T and we've got the Copper Load. I hate Copper Loads. They've got those awful teeth. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I try not put them in. <laughs> um, I love the Copper Teeth. And here's just a picture of the inserters on the right, so the difference between the, the Kylina and the Mirena inserters. The method's exactly the same. Like I said, that the applicator's just slightly thinner on the Kylina device. Um, and just to say an important update there that came about since COVID, um, we've got a lot to thank COVID for, but not in the least um, some extended use of LARC recommendations. So this was sort of came out of um, Europe and the UK where women were really finding uh, restrictions and lockdowns was a real barrier to access. Um, so what, and the, the UK FSRH really drove these recommendations and then the Family Planning Alliance reviewed things and came out with some recommendations to be used in Australia, which are probably quite relevant now as we're seeing more, more sites going into lockdown, that um, the... Implant can be extended off-label for up to four years. The Marina can be extended off-label for up to six years. Kylina can't. It's still five years. A standard size T-shaped copper IUD can be extended to 12 years and a five-year copper IUD can be extended to six years. Obviously, counselling the woman around, you know, the risk of, of pregnancy and what that would mean for her, and we could counsel about additional use of condoms. But that is just important to know if you've got lockdowns causing access problems and the woman's, you know, Marina passed five years a month ago, that we can quite reassuringly tell her that she can rely on that device for another 12 months and there's no rush to get that in. So that's just important to be aware of. And that statement is available on that LARC resource that, that I spoke about before. Register our practices around LARC. So just to, I guess, highlight uh, uh, this, this same paper actually that I spoke about for, before, which highlighted the subproterone prescribing. This was a, a paper published by one of the GP Synergy academic registrars that looked at recent data um, and the associations with, with LARC prescribing. And it, it looked at uh, almost 2,000 registrars, just over 5,000 um, problems and diagnoses involving women aged 12 to 55, where contraception was was um, prescribed 25 percent of these involved LARC and what we found was that LARC prescription was more likely if the registrar had some postgraduate training and qualifications specific to sexual and reproductive health so for example if they'd done their transcog or they'd done the family planning certificate there was more LARC prescribed in regional and remote locations LARC was more likely to be prescribed if there were learning goals set around LARC so, or if they sought the registrar sought assistance from their supervisor. LARC was prescribed more to older women and more often by a female registrar. So I guess the take-home message for us as supervisors here is to really consider facilitating all registrars to seek further training and competency in LARC insertion and provision. Be aware of pathways to support this in your practice in your local area. So, you know, if you're not a LARC inserter yourself, 
you know, talking to someone in your practice who, who might be, who might be willing to support the registrars or finding out, you know, what other practices are available locally um, and what local courses are available and pathways for practical experience um, for assisting the registrars to gain that LARC training. So, you know, there's the... Um, Ranscog have their Certificate of Women's Health. Uh, family planning organisations around Australia run IUD and Implanon insertion training. Some of the regional training providers have Implanon workshops. There are also some other locally run courses that some local education agencies do run. And having those local supervision pathways is important. And that, that resource, that FPAA resource on LARC that I highlighted before does have some written training standards um, for you to to really help your registrar be aware of. So I'm aware that we're, we're running to the end with time. So what we might do now is quickly run through a case study. We might spend a couple of minutes on this and then I'll have Simon um, run through some of the, the Q&A. So what we'll do with this case study is as we go, I'll ask a few questions and if you just want to pop into the chat what you would do um, and then we can, we can talk through as we go. So we've got a case study here. This is I'll probably do this one about 10 times a day. Um, we've got young Abby, she's 15, and she's made an appointment to come and see you for some contraception. She, she's come in by herself. She's in her school uniform. She says she's been having sex with her boyfriend for three months now. So what things do we want to know? So if you just pop in, you know, a couple of point forms, what, what are you going to ask? What, what do you want to know? What are you going to do in the next 15 minutes to work out what you're going to do with Abby? All right, so how old's the boyfriend? Coercion, gold star there. Um, do they use condoms? Is it consensual? Gillick competency? You guys have read my presentation. Query parental consent. Is the cycles regular? Any PID? Uh, great. So lots of really important things there. Um, all right, so... We've got a lot of really important things. So obviously we're going to do our, our medical assessment. So as someone said, regular cycles. So we're going to look at her menstrual history. Is she having regular periods? Is she having any breakthrough bleeding, post-coital bleeding? Is there any is she on any medications? Is there any significant medical history? Um, does she have any, you know, symptoms at all? Dyspareunia, altered discharge. Is there a family history of VTE? What's her smoking status? We're going to opportunistically offer some STI screening for Abby. Um, and we're going to do some focused examination, including her BMI, her BP. And if she is symptomatic, if she does disclose any symptoms, such as abnormal bleeding, vaginal discharge, vulval soreness, itch, dyspareunia, we'll be examining her as well. Um, very correctly, a lot of you did identify in the chat some child protection issues. So it's always useful to go back to basics with young people and remember our heads assessment. Um, age of the partner is very important given that Abby is 15 and Gillick competency is where if we have a minor under the age of 16, we have to assess whether she is capable of understanding the treatment, understanding the consequences of the treatment. And if we do assess her as Gillick competence, we are able to legally prescribe without gaining any parental consent. Um, and so in all states of New South Wales, anyone under 16 assessed as Gillick competent can consent to medical treatment. In New South Wales, there is a bit of a grey area where if they're under 14, parental consent is still encouraged. But that said, I prescribe a lot of pills to people younger than 14 without parental consent. So it really is about a case by case assessment of assessing, you know, is this young woman a mature minor or is she Gillick competent? Um, and also very importantly there, somebody did highlight, um, you know, assessing whether there is coercion. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're exploring whether there's uh, consensual intercourse taking place. Um, age of the reproductive partner is, is important there because, you know, if it's if it's a 20-year-old who's her music teacher or a, a school tutor, then obviously we've got a, a relationship imbalance there and we've got mandatory reporting um, responsibilities there to think about. But if her partner is 16, goes to the same school as her, you know, no evidence of coercion or you know power imbalance there um she's gillet competent then we can absolutely prescribe and there are some resources that will come to you that that can support you but it, it is important
important that your registrars are confident around those those legalities. Um, so Abby is 15. She's two years post-menarche. She's got regular periods. Last period was two weeks ago. She's had sex this cycle. She's asymptomatic. She has some migraine with visual aura, which she uses episodic trip turns for. Her boyfriend's 17 and goes to the same school in the year above her. Um, so the combined oral contraceptive pill is contraindicated, UK MEC4, because of her migraines. So we can offer her some progesterone-only options. We can talk to her about LARC. We're going to do a chlamydia and gonorrhea PCR on a um, – we can do a urine or a low vaginal swab, but low vaginal swab has slightly higher – um, sensitivity to a urine. Um, so at family planning, we, we do a lot of self-collected, we'll send the, the women to the bathroom to collect a self-collected self swab. And we can consider some bloodborne viral screening as well, because even people who are low risk to things like syphilis and HIV still often have some um, high rates of, of infection there. So we can consider offering her some bloodborne virus screening as well. Consent, as we've discussed, she can consent to her own treatment without parental involvement if she is Gillick competent. In this case, there is no need to report if it is a consensual relationship, there is no coercion or power imbalance and if no concerns. So in this case, even though the partner is over 17, uh, sorry, over 16. There is a similar age defence where if, if they are both within two years of each other, then the partner is not guilty of, of any, you know, technical offence there. Um, there's a really good link and all of the links will be pr provided to you in resources there at the bottom of the page. That, that link there is to a resource from Shopfront Youth Legal Centre and it's just a, a two or three page PDF that goes through these laws of consent really nicely. So that's a really good resource to share with your registrar. That's the Shopfront Youth Legal Centre resource. Okay. Okay, so we'll get to questions and discussions. Just before we get to that one too, there was a question that came through um, on the pre-questions about migraine with aura that gets better with, with um, the combined pill or, you know, people who get menstrual migraines. Um, migraine with aura does remain a, a UK MEC for contraindication. Um, if people are getting menstrual migraine and it's not migraine with aura, we can consider shortening the pill-free week with some transdermal estrogen during that pill-free week, which is off-label. Or there is actually a, a um, proprietary product called Seasonique, which is a, a, a non-PBS pill. Basically, it's three packs of Levlin cycled together with instead of sugar pills in the, the pill-free week, it's got some estrogen pills so women don't get that, that withdrawal headache. All right, I, I am aware we've only got sort of four minutes left, so I am sorry that we haven't got much time for questions and discussions. So, Simon, if you want to maybe run through what sort of, if there's any common themes on questions. There was one question going back to the pill. Is any OCP okay with cloasma? Ah, oh, cloasma, that's an interesting one. So, so cloasma is that sort of brown pigmentation of the skin and it does relate to the estrogen. So if a woman does have cloasma, it's, it's potentially going to get worse on any of the estrogen containing pills and there is a chance that it can be irreversible so if there's significant cloasma we, we would really be advising uh, a progesterone only option of contraception um, and you know even just going to a lower dose pill we may still run into problems with cloasma and there's a question, I think your presentation on Slinda, which is an, I always think the names of these pills <laughs> that are chosen are extraordinary. There must be sort of committees of people sitting yeah. around focus groups, but Slinda and breastfeeding. Do you know? Yeah, so um, in the phase three data, breastfeeding women were included. Um, so it will be, I imagine, like any of the other progesterone um, only pills, quite safe. So we, we might actually just allow you to touch on yep. those last resources yeah, and sure. references, Sally. So there is a, a contraception teaching plan available from the GP Supervisors Australia website. It's a really excellent resource. So I've had a look through there. Um, we've just updated, I think, the picture there. There were just a few of the little resources we're going to update, but it's a really good approach to um, contraception with your registrars with some really great resources there. Um, I have included a list of all of the, the really important resources that I've highlighted through the talk, and this will be distributed to all of you. So all those really important websites, STI guidelines, cancer screening guidelines, those UK FSRH guidelines, the new therapeutic guidelines, um, 
And then that Family Planning Alliance Australia on LARC, that, that's a really important go-to. And that Shopfront Youth Legal Centre, that's a really great document to look at around issues of consent. So it's been um, fabulous to have you present tonight. I think the supervisors have learned a lot and hopefully can not only use that information in their own clinical practice, but teach their registrars some of those really important um, aspects of contraceptive practice. So thanks very, very much. Great. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, and we'll leave you to it and look forward to seeing you at an upcoming GPSA webinar. Thanks all.